Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of webinars on Aniridia. My name is Helen Mopsik, and I'm not lucky enough to work with the Vision for Tomorrow Foundation. Today is March 17, 2011, and we're fortunate to have Dr. James Lauderdale presenting the genetics of Aniridia. Dr. Lauderdale is joining us from the University of Georgia's Department of Cellular Biology, where he's an associate professor, and more importantly, to the Aniridia community, a researcher whose lab's been studying the role of PAC6 in eye development. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. Once Dr. Lauderdale starts speaking, um, if you have a question related to a specific slide he's talking about, please press the hand button that's located on the lower right of your screen. When I see that someone has a question, I'll wait for a break in the slide and prompt you to verbally ask your question. Dr. Lauderdale is also going to be, pause, is also going to be pausing to ask for questions between sections of the presentation. If for some reason your microphone is not working on your computer, you'll be able to use the text feature and I'll, to ask your question, ask your question and I'll ask it so that the entire audience can hear it. So, without further delay, please welcome Dr. Lauderdale. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Lauderdale, and I'm going to be talking about, as you heard, the genetics of aniridia. Uh, I have to say this is new for me. I've been teaching for quite a while, uh, but this is the first time I've actually taught to my computer screen and expected to talk back to me. Um, some of you I see, uh, I see several friends and familiar uh, names in the, the group today. So what I'm going to do is to cover some of the basics of aniridia uh, in terms of eye development and in terms of the genes that are involved in eye development. Some of you have heard parts of this before, um, but I decided this is the right place to go for the first of this series. And so without further ado, let's talk about genetics of aniridia. As many of you know, aniridia is a congenital eye disorder that affects about 1 in 60,000 children. It's typically caused by mutations in PAC6, which makes it an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, but we'll get back, we're, we're going to come back to this idea in uh, a few slides. The important thing is that it's a panocular disorder that mean it means it affects different parts of the eye, including the iris, the uh, cornea, so the blood vessels that you see here on the right-hand side, uh, cataract, which is uh, evident in this particular eye on the right, uh, and the things that you can't see are foveal or optic nerve hypoplasia and an involuntary eye movement called nystagmus. It is a progressive disorder. Uh, it in, often includes glaucoma, aneritic keratopathy, which is an emerging uh, recognized disorder, and it can ultimately lead to blindness. <clears throat> so vision really depends on the correct formation of the eye, and, so, and we don't think about this very often, but unlike most of the organ systems in the body, the eye has to have all the parts working together in order for vision to occur. And so light enters the front of the eye, shown to your left, through the cornea. It passes, uh, in normal people, it passes through the iris and the lens, and then be focused at the back of the eye on a structure called the fovea. Most of the visual, um, the bending of light necessary for vision actually comes from the cornea, which is at the anterior left of the eye. The lens is actually only involved in near and far accommodation, so it allows us to have near-far uh, vision. So that we all have uh, the basic anatomy of the eye in mind, the uh, working from left to right, the anterior part of the eye has the ciliary body, which is this pink structure shown that I just marked with an arrow. The iris, the pupil, which of course is the, the space between the iris, the cornea, which is the front surface of the eye, and the retina, which is at the back of the eye. The retina itself can be divided into seven main cell types. So the, there are the retinal ganglial cells, which are the only cells that send information to the brain. Light is, in fact, gathered at the very back of the eye by the rods and cones, which are shown in yellow and pink. And light information gathered by the rod is sent forward to the retinal ganglial cells. The retinal ganglial cells, I just marked what the blue one, via the bipolar cells and the amacrine, via the bipolar cells, 
the horizontal cells, which are shown in green, and the amorphous cells shown in blue, are actually interneurons that help process the light signal. So all of these cells are important for facilitating the transmission of light from the photoreceptors to the brain. There's one other cell type, the glia. These green cells uh, that are sort of in the, the region marked INL. Uh, the Mueller glia are a support cell that helps keep the, um, keep the retina uh, functioning. If we look at the fovea, and so in humans, the, the region of highest visual acuity is in the fovea. And so we need to worry about some regional differences in retinal structure. The cones, which are primarily responsible for nighttime vision, are, excuse me, the cones, which are primarily um, responsible for daytime vision, are in the central retina, which is shown by this green arrow. The central retina, um, which is where the fovea is located. The rods, which are primarily responsible for the nighttime vision, are located out here at the periphery. And if you compare the distribution of rods to cones, you can see that although there are some cones out in the periphery, they're relatively no, low in number. If we look at the back of the eye, as one would see from an ophthalmoscope, there are three structures that we need to pay attention to. The first is the optic disc. So that is where the optic nerve is. Optic 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 this is the blind spot in the eye. It's also where the blood, major blood vessels to the eye enter. The second region of interest is the macula, which is the structure. It has a pigmented appearance in the back of the eye. And in the center, or near the center of the uh, macula, is the fovea. And so the fovea, again, is the point at which all light rays are focused on the eye. It's the point where the majority of cones are. This is also the point where we have the greatest uh, visual acuity. In order to understand aniridia, it's necessary to go back and begin to understand the steps in eye development. So working from left to right, early in development, uh, in this case, the panel lab labeled 4MM embryo. Uh, these are a series of scanning EMs taken from a chick embryo, but it's representative of all vertebrates, including humans. Where I've just put the arrow is the beginning of the optic stalk leading to the optic vesicle, which is the structure all the way over here to the right. The optic vesicle is the uh, is really part of the brain that's pushing out early in development. If you look below that to the uh, cartoon labeled A, you can see that the optic vesicle is drawn touching the lens uh, that overlines what would be skin, would be skin, initiating a conversation between the retina or the developing retina and the skin that will ultimately lead to the formation of the lens placard. As development begins to proceed, so as we work to panel B, we see that the uh, optic uh, begins to pop, begins to uh, invaginate a little bit to form a cup. That's shown schematically down in panels B and C in the cartoon. As the cup begins to fold in on itself, the innermost layer, so now if we work over to panel C of the uh, scanning EM, I just marked it with an arrow, the innermost layer of the optic cup becomes the retinal pigmented epithelium, which is uh, an important structure at the back of the eye. The next arrow marks the developing retina, and then the third arrow marks the developing lens. If you look all the way over to the edge, where I just marked uh, another arrow with another arrow, that's the leftover bit of skin that's going to become the cornea. If we look at panel D of the scanning EM with the seven millimeter embryo, uh, you can see that the lens has already taken on a rounded shape, so it has connected, and this is the start of the lens proper. The retina underneath is starting to differentiate a little bit, and I'll explain what that means. But essentially, the cells types that are going to make the eye are starting to be born. If we look down at the bottom 
in the cartoon with panel E, we can see that very quickly the eye takes on its sort of characteristic shape with the optic cup uh, giving rise to the neural, ret neural layer of the retina. The back part is the retinal pigment of epithelium. And then as we come forward, we have the cornea, uh, which will uh, form the outermost covering of the eye. So if we look back at the uh, schematic of the adult human eye, adult human eye, the interactions between the essentially what is part of the central nervous system and the neural retina and the overlying bit of skin, which is now the cornea, um, we can see that the, the two layers have formed many structures of the eye that are important to us. So the retina, the outer surface of the cornea, and the lens. But in order to appreciate all that's going on, we have to bring in another tissue type. So this is the province of the ocular mesenchyme. In these schematics, it's, these cartoons, it's shown as the red little uh, things that look like petals. So in the upper left-hand corner, in the panel that's labeled E12.5, you can see a lot of these little petals, petal-like structures. These are actually migrating cells. The cells are coming from a different part of the nervous system. They're migrating into the front of the eye. And when all is said and done, the, these migrating cells are going to give rise to the structures of the adult eye that include the, let's see if I can get my arrow here, these are going to include the stroma of the cornea, which is sort of this middle, this thick layer in between, the, the corneal endothelium, which is this thin blue layer over on the far right with the, uh, the schematic of the adult human eye. It's going to give rise to the stroma of both the iris, shown down here at E15.5, and then also over here, it would be this layer on the adult eye. The stroma of the ciliary body, which is shown again in E15.5 cartoon in yellow, and then that would be roughly this layer on the adult eye. So the important thing is that the eye develops from essentially three different tissues, the neural tissue, the skin, overlying skin, ectoderm, and then also the migratory neural crest. The ability of the eye to form all of these structures requires a very uh, exquisite conversation that's taking place between the, the neural tissue of the neural retina the overlying skin ectoderm, which is going to give rise to the cornea and the lens. The lens itself is talking to these other structures and helping coordinate that all of these different tissue types develop together appropriately. Problems in any one of these steps can give rise to different eye defects. The eye defects that we are going to be most interested in are, of course, those that are caused by the PAC-6 gene. But before I move on, are there any questions about uh, the basics of eye development in terms of how the tissues interact? 